I am really privileged to introduce uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, Dr. Sharma is the Senior Vice President of Operations and Quality for Mount Sinai Heart. He is the Director of Clinical and Interventional Cardiology of the Mount Sinai Health System and President of the Mount Sinai Heart Network and Dean of Interventional Clinical Affiliations, as well as Director of Interventional Cardiology for the Cardiovascular Institute. He is a philanthropist, and the Mount Sinai Cath Lab is now named as the Dr. Dr. Samin K. Sharma Family Foundation Cardiac Catheterization Lab. Dr. Sharma has built a 250-bed heart hospital in his native Jaipur, India, to provide the best affordable care to all patients, irrespective of their financial and social status. And I also want to say, I have to say this every year, that Dr. Sharma was one of the first recipients of the Nurse uh, Award Nurse, the Department of Nursing always does the Physician of a Year Award, and he received it, I think, in 2006. So, you know, you can just tell that he is just so supportive and wonderful. So it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Samin Sharma. Thank you. All right, Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. We started this journey in 1998. Right from the beginning, I had the vision uh, not only do a complex uh, uh, symposium, that we have to have our staff, cath lab and nurse tech um, uh, and cardiovascular technicians, and that led to this such a, uh, I would say, excellent gathering for today. And what uh, Beth showed, she's very detailed and focused with the certifications. Now, what does certificate mean? Well, it basically probably the same thing which you do every day, but it is then recognized by some extra mural agency, and that gives you validation. And therefore, it requires extra work. But what it does, it brings us up, all of us up, to do, deliver better care. And of course, uh, uh, Beth mentioned the teamwork, and the team is always there. And you saw that I made a little modification of the teamwork. Those who have the book, this is by Sharma. A team is not only a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust each other also. So both, there had to be a trust in the team to make this happen and to succeed. With that note, I really uh, thank Beth uh, for organizing this uh, faculty and Heidi, uh, both of them, and uh, to make this uh, conference. When I saw that uh, there are a lot of very rich agenda, there'll be some jeopardy, some uh, raffles and all. You all will be very happy. And of course, I know some people are saying this cold. The bag, as you know, is a blanket. You can take it out if necessary. <laughs> Hopefully it won't be necessary. All right, so just to say uh, that I present those my top 10 advances, used to be only a year end, but now I've been knowing that five months before our June symposium, a lot of things happened. So we made it from mid-year mid of the last year to mid-year of this year. So 2021, 22. Uh, uh, the, clearly where we are now, the technique of the interventional cardiology started by Balloon angioplasty by Andrus Grunzik, doing in 1977 in Zurich. And uh, I mean, clearly, well, since then, we, we, we call him, of course, the father of angioplasty. Things have changed significantly. That time, we were keeping patients five days in the hospital. Now, majority of them go home same day. But his dream was always catheter-based percutaneous treatment of vascular disease in alert and awake patient. So was his concept... He's the one actually started the live conferences. Used to do uh, when he moved to uh, Emory. Uh, there is just like an OR setup, cath lab, and then there's auditorium around. So the key was that the see one, teach one, do one, all this concept started. And after the training, looking at it, used to get certificate and go and do the angioplasty. That is how uh, this whole field started. And now we actually kind of make it perfect in the sense that do it safety, appropriateness, they do it only people who needs it. Because that is one of the biggest criticism of the stent procedure. Maybe you're doing too many stents, but if you're appropriate, that's where you help the patient, community, and so, and ambulatory. This is my quotation that uh, majority we know, 60 plus percent patients go home same day. So these basically, the which I'm going to show, the top 10 advances which have changed our practice. We start with the first one. We, we encounter patients who are ineligible, ineligible for cabbage because we complex disease or complex medical condition, not only the disease, 
You call surgical consult, they say, ah, I can't do this surgery, very high risk. And we know the STS, many of uh, you belong to surgical group, where STS is the overall risk calculation, and anything more than four is considered as a moderate to high risk, eight is like very high. And so what we did is that let's see the patients who are surgically turned down, 750 patients. Everybody had a hard team discussion, but make it ineligible, and then followed it that what happens to these patients. And a very complex, uh, you see the baseline medical conditions of the surgical ineligibility. And uh, these are the complex CAD also. And of course, uh, left main in 38%, and atherectomy in 32%, hemodynamic support in 27%. So really tough cases. So what did we find? That basically the outcomes, the one is they have a complex disease, by opening those blockages, we brought their syntax score. Syntax is basically every blockage in the coronary, we give a number. And any number less than 22 is considered as a low syntax score. 23 through 32 is intermediate. 33 and above is high. So this, these all patients have a very high syntax score. But then they became low by intervention. As you can show here, many of them had a syntax score of like zero. All vessels were opened up. What did it do? Mortality was 5.6% at 30 days, 3% in hospital, which goes with various published data. Now, surgeon predicted actually mortality just double than what was noted in this. These are high risk cases and six month mortality was 12%. So you say, well, is it, isn't it too high? But I can tell you these patients, if they don't get intervention, their mortality probably would have been 25%. The second is the A1C uh, association with cardiovascular outcome post-PCI. We always talk about it. Diabetes have a bad predictor and so, but there are some scan, sketchy data. There are some trials have shown too aggressive diabetes control kills people. So remember A1C used to be like go to 5.5, 6, turns out to be not good. Probably 6.57 is better. But more importantly, we say, what happened to the PCI? As you know, in the cath lab, every patient room before getting the PCI, get besides other tests, they get CRP and A1C. So this is the data came from our center. Mount Sinai, large interventional database published in circulation of 14,000 patients. And various groups of patients, what type of A1C values are shown here. Majority of them, I would say, nicely well controlled if you take it as seven as a cutoff. So you can say they are about a little more than a half, but of course many of them, A1C is very uncontrolled. It should be more than eight, not 80%. And of course, those who have higher A1C, more complex disease, they are older and uh, other comorbid conditions. But two interesting observations came. One, if your A1C was low, less than 5.5, you have higher chance of death at one year. Very surprising although it has been kind of mimicked in other uh, trials of diabetes, that is strict control is not good. Second, if you are not well controlled, then you develop more myocardial infarction. Why? You, you start popping up the new blockages, plaque ruptures. Now, target vessel, it's a little su surprising to us, although it looked maybe a little trend, but overall did not make any difference, that your restenosis was not different based on the A1C. This was a U-shaped curve, and just to show that your sweet spot, we have very nice uh, editorial, which I put it here, sweet spot for A1C value is 6.5 to 7.5. So not less than six, not more than eight, in that range is the one we should be working on. The third is drug-coated balloon in the small vessels. Now, what is a drug-coated balloon? Drug-coated balloon is not a stent, it's a balloon with a drug on, and it's kind of put in by various, uh, the technology that once you inflate, the drug comes off and stays in the coronary arteries. So, of course, peripheral also, peripheral drug coated balloons have been approved for many years, but coronary has not been approved in the United States. So, this you can use it in the ISR if there is stent already reblocked or in the de novo vessel. And a lot of data have come that drug coated balloon do work. More important is in the small arteries. So, we have, there are question one time. Drug coated balloon for the peripheral arteries had a mortality, but for the coronaries, it be noted that there was no increased mortality, rather slightly lower mortality in the drug coated balloon compared to alternative treatment. 
And why it happens, it is beneficial that one, you're not putting a, another stent and lower depth dependence and of course um, the, the ch less chance of thrombosis and so. So therefore drug coated balloon is available, available outside United States, but has not come to um, United States yet, but will be there. We will be part of uh, two companies which are uh, look, bringing the device in uh, America and uh, likely to start in first quarter of 2023. Now, why it was delayed by FDA? Because of the controversy that in peripheral arteries, drug-coated balloon was associated with higher mortality. But then they did the analysis, overall message now is, it's not associated with higher mortality. So we have the data of the small coronary arteries. So do you put a stent or you do a drug-coated balloon? Artery 2.5 millimeter or less. And overall showed that drug-coated balloon and drug-eluting stents are identical outcomes at three years. And then individual subgroup, analysis, particularly diabetic. So you see here, diabetes as such have a higher event rate compared to non-diabetic. But more importantly, that in diabetic patient, drug-coated balloon have associated with a significantly lower TVR compared to drug-eluting stent. So therefore, it seems to be that in diabetic patient, we will be using some drug-coated balloon in a small arteries and so. So also showed acute coronary syndrome is there no difference. So the, basically, where do we, will we use it? In small arteries, in instant restenosis, and of course, you do a drug-coated balloon, artery doesn't open well, you can always put a stent in some suboptimal angiographic results. So then imaging trial, you know, of the various imaging devices besides just the angiogram, IVAS, OCT. OCT is very specific because of it tells you about the cap thickness. We call thin cap or, or, or cap thickness, because we've shown that if you're thin cap, that causes rupture of the plaque and associated with acute coronary syndrome in the future. And then we have the yellow plaque, nears, that fatty laden plaque are the one which associated with plaque rupture in the future. And so the, all these are interrelated. And then the FFR or IFR, physiological point of view. We have done a lot of work on those, that which case should get a PCI based on the FFR, IFR numbers, which is 0.8 for FFR, 0.89 for IFR. And these are all used in our cath lab, not in all cases, but in majority, uh, particularly IFR and FFR, and imaging in about 20% of cases to make us better operator and get our good results. The study has shown that I was guided intervention is associated with lower mortality. Two major trials, if you take follow-up at uh, uh, three years, that this is the angiographic uh, guided PCI and uh, I was guided PCI, the mortality became one-third. So seems to be point there that using I was during your intervention, particularly more complex cases, long lesions associated with a lower mortality at a follow-up. So then the other, there are few other randomized trials, these are the follow-up data. And then we have three trials. One was comparing IVAS with OCT and angiogram. So question was that which one is better from the technique point of view. And this is a small trial called EyeSight randomized trial. So I think they've moved. Back. Okay. Yeah. So overall at 2.5, there was no much difference in terms of outcome, but if we can go back to the slide, let me see if I can go back, yeah. So what we showed that compared to angiography, OCT and IVAS caused the better stent expansion. So whatever we see on angiogram, and we do this imaging, you do a better uh, expansion of the stent. Although in a small study, didn't show much difference in terms of clinical outcome, but it's a trial of 150 patients. Then question was, do you do a PCI based on the FFR or IVAS? And this was the <coughs> flavor trial, and it showed the specific criteria uh, for the IVAS as well as for FFR. Overall outcomes were not different, so it seems to be even 24 months uh, individual clinical outcomes or angina class were not different, so it seems to be whether you use angiogram or FFR guided PCI have an equal outcome, So, but something should be done. Then question comes, patient have a STEMI, Come to the cath lab, only 70% lesion. And good TV3 flow. Should we stent it? That's where the question is. So OCT guided trial, erosion, that you do OCT guidance, special features of the OCT, then only you stent, or you do based on the angiogram, and basically showed that OCT guided, because there is erosion, calcific nodule, you end up stenting. In a small number of cases, 
compared to angiography. So 59% had a stent and this 70% of low lesion post MI compared to 44%. Is that good or bad? Well, if you put a less stent and patients still have a good outcome at follow-up, it's a very good thing. So this is basically showed that you can identify which case uh, should get the stent or not, and these are the individual endpoints in the trial. Then, many times we have negative FFR, which is, FFR is more than 0.8, but patient comes back with MI or angina a few months later. Why? So, well, we have a trial called combined OCT FFR, and basically, combined OCT FFR trial was the patients who were negative FFR, they did the OCT, and with the OCT finding, that if you have thin cap, on the OCT, your event rate was 12%. If your no thin cap was 3%, it means four times higher. And this was the cap, cap thickness. See, very thin cap compared to thick cap. So it seems to be that if you have thin cap, even your FFR is good, 0.89 or 0.9, is associated with the bad outcome. So maybe those cases should be stented. We have two randomized trials. We'll hear about in them in next few years. Define GPS, which is IFR guided, and comparing OCT versus NGO ILUMIN4. Then CIN, another risk factor which came from Mount Sinai International Database uh, to predict long-term MACE. Uh, and this is the again A1C as well as this major journal, circulation and uh, Lancet. Data came from Mount Sinai and uh, in uh, Jack. All the three major publications in 2021-22 came from our interventional database at Mount Sinai, which a lot of people are, some people who manage, they are here, and under Roxana Mehran's uh, leadership, she actually had an old score uh, called uh, the contrast-associated acute kidney injury score. These were the old. This was like 2004, but needed to upgrade now. That what is in the this new current age, and there are various different definitions, and basically found out again in 15,000 patients who have baseline creatinine and follow-up, and look at this, what is happening now. If you take one criteria of this AKI, the number is going down. The contrast-induced injury, because why we are careful, we use a small amount of dye, prepare patient, do some imaging, and the incidence of AKI is going down, but more importantly, she developed a predictive model by various factors taken into account uh, of age, sex, and so, uh, and initially derived and then validate in the model, and it turns out to be, it is very predictive. And what they show it, if you develop kidney injury, your mortality is much higher, not only at 30 days, even at one year. So it seems to be kidney injury is a bad thing, and there is another study which has shown that if you have a contrast injury, you have higher mortality at follow-up, and uh, more important, if you have no normal creatinine and no, no contrast induced, the, at two year mortality is 5%. But if you have either high creatinine at the baseline or you develop acute kidney injury, it doubles. But if you have high creatinine and develop acute kidney injury, you triple. And you require dialysis, it becomes sevenfold. Very important. So kidney uh, is very important uh, that we talk about uh, that little bit of MI, but no, creatinine is big. So nice editorial. That bump in creatinine post-PCI might bump off your patient. So we need to take every precaution to decrease this uh, contrast nephropathy. Then the depth de-escalation. What we have learned nowadays is that basically you need more strong antiplatelet therapy in the early time, and after that you don't need them. Our stent techniques and rest of the risk factor modification is so good. What happens is all this strong antiplatelet therapy of presagrol, ticagrelor, they are associated with higher bleeding rate. So in last few years, there we have many trials to de-escalate, particularly after 30 days. And this is the one of the trial called Telos AMI. One month, everybody got aspirin ticagrelor after MI, and after one month, they randomized the patient to aspirin, clopidogrel, or continued ticagrelor. or large number of patients, about 2,700, and basically found that if you go back after one month to, to clopidogrel rather than ticagrelor, or your event rate goes down by half, and usually because of the bleeding. No difference in ischemic endpoint, but bleeding becomes half. So therefore, you didn't lose anything. You didn't pay, remain, safety remained, but bleeding goes down, so therefore we now 
lot of emphasis on de-escalation of this strong antiplatelet therapy. Many of the trials are shown here. The second question is, patient has done six, uh, six months, 18 months, or dual antiplatelet therapy after stenting. Now, what do we do usually? We say, okay, stop the plavis now and continue your aspirin. So this trial, host exam, evaluated that what should be the better drug? Should be the aspirin or should be clopidogrel? So after index period of six to 18 months, patients were randomized with their aspirin or clopidogrel. So this is actually, there used to be a trial called Capri, which were done 20 years ago. Uh, and that was patients with the peripheral artery disease, coronary artery disease, and so. So same, basically showed that clopidogrel associated with a lower event rate compared to aspirin. So now you can make it a point that probably it caused less bleeding and less acute coronary syndrome. That on maintenance, maybe, maybe patients should be on clopidogrel, not on aspirin. And as you know, many of the trials of aspirin in the last few years have come negative. Primary prevention, secondary prevention in diabetic, elderly, females, all have shown aspirin is a kind of value of the aspirin is going down, down, down. And this is another trial to show that. Then also same in the same field that rather than giving long-term dual antiplatelet therapy, can you shorten it? Then one of them in high bleeding risk patient called master DAPT, the give one month versus continue your five plus month and basically showed net event is equal, ischemic endpoints equal, but lower bleeding rate. So this is where the whole question comes down to that by the abbreviating your DAPT, one month you have lower bleeding rate, whether patient even have prior MI as shown here. Then the same way was that trial called STOP, uh, STOP DAPT 2 ACS trial that what about acute coronary syndrome? Can you go down to one month in acute coronary syndrome? This one was one month DAPT compared to 12 months. And what did we find? That although not much difference uh, in the overall event rate at one year. But if you go individually, the red bar is one month and uh, the, this brown bar is uh, your 12 month DAPT that associated with higher MI. So it tells you that in acute coronary syndrome, you cannot go down to one month, any longer. Now, it did have lower bleeding, but a trade off having MI. So of course we will not like that. So clearly in acute coronary syndrome, you do not want that. There's another trial called one month DAP done in Korea, has a similar kind of message that overall then acute coronary syndrome, your event rate in one month was 7.2% versus five. So that actually goes into the guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology that in patients uh, in acute coronary syndrome, you need to continue dual antiplatelet therapy for minimum one year. Of course, patients who are very high bleeding risk, you may come down to one, but otherwise routine run of the mill one year or even longer after one year in many of these patients. Then left main. So left main, basically we did the trial called Excel, which was a five year data, which I presented last year also. And there was a controversy about mortality. At five year, there were 13% mortality in PCI, 9.9% mortality in the cabbage group. And this was not a primary endpoint and lot in the literature that it was uh, the data were not correctly presented and so on and so forth. So then we have a very nice um, meta-analysis of all the left main trials. Randomized left main trial comparing cabbage versus PCI, syntax, pre-combat, novel, and Excel. Up to five to 10 year follow-up Large number of patients, 4,400, with syntax score of mean uh, 25. And this is the individual characteristics. And what did we find? That every year, yes, cabbage had lower mortality, but we are talking about 1% in five years, 0.2% per year, if you combine all the four trials. In 10 years, is 2%, because 0.2%. So we have follow up to 10 years. So it seems to be, if you take all the trial, not individual trial, that overall mortality of the cabbage and PCI is identical. Now, do have a little higher MI, uh, the stroke rate was numerically lower, but higher target lesion revascularization. So we know that. Anytime we are tell the patient that, you know, as long as the patient is not having complication, they may be okay to come back as long as they can safely avoid the bypass surgery. And the individual other endpoints are shown here. And the more complex the disease, the cabbage did better compared to PCI. So I think the jury is still out there, what we should do for the left main patients, particularly if not a high syntax score of 33 and above. Now then the technical trial called EBC main 
to see whether you do a culotte or step, one stand versus two stand, and overall it showed that uh, it kind of your provisional stenting because we had a trial DK crush. Five showed that two stents were better, but now new trials showed that maybe provisional stent, but some cases you may have to put a second stent, maybe slightly better, although numerically p-value is no, not uh, uh, significant, but maybe slightly better compared to the overall. So I think it still remains, we still try to use a two stent approach rather than the single stent in the bifurcation. So it's left main, it still remain that high syntax score still goes for cabbage, low syntax score are okay for the PCI. Then we FFR had been done very commonly, and we actually quality parameter in the many cath lab is like ours. We, we follow FFR use in our cath lab to 65% to each interventionist, and we have the report card of every month. But there are some trials now, I'd like things come in full circle. We have two trials which were negative using FFR. First one was FFR guided PCI compared to bypass in a complex CAD, not left main. So three vessel disease in 1500 patient, uh, based on the angiogram, patient had cabbage, they didn't do FFR, but FFR guided PCI. And what did we find? They did a best job in terms of PCI preparation and the cabbage outcomes, but overall in outcome were at one year, 10.6% with the PCI, 6.9% with the FFR guided PCI, and these are the individual endpoints shown here. One of the important points was higher revascularization and higher MI rate. So it seems to be, this is totally contradictory than what we are taught. But again, we are not, com we are not compare that with the cabbage yet. This is the first time done, so it's make a point also that sometimes significant lesion. You do a bypass, you are protective. So basically FFR guided PCI lost. In, we had done so many other trials. We never lost in one year with the cabbage versus PCI, but we did. But more importantly, in the simple cases, PCI a lower outcome, complex cases, high syntax score, cabbage has definitely superior to uh, PCI, which we learned. So overall event rate compared to old syntax and fame, our event rate has almost half. And uh, the also only thing positive of the trial was patient quickly felt better after the PCI. And, and less than 65 years of age, more people went back to their work. So early return to work, which had been shown by other trials also, and so. Then a patient has multi-vessel PCI, you did a culprit PCI, what should you do for the second vessel, which is we call non-culprit. And this is the trial called Flowers MI, that either you based on the NGO, you put a stent, or you put a stent only FFR guided that if it's less than 0.8. And basically, uh, in a NGO, almost everybody got the stent. FFR guided one third did not get the stent. And overall outcome shown here, that FFR guided PCI was slightly inferior, particularly that more revascularization, although MI numerically higher, although p-value was 0.31. But if you take individual point that any revascularization was 6.5 in the FFR guided, 4.5 in the NGO guided. So it seems to be that in acute MI setting, FFR of the non-culprit vessel may not be the right indicator. Probably you go with the angiogram and do the PCI. And the top and advance, I would say, is the 2021 guidelines for PCI, for coronary artery revascularization. And this is actually done by one of the chair of the committee uh, is uh, Jacqueline Tamis. Uh, she's the director of quality at uh, Mount Sinai uh, Morningside and uh, Jennifer Lawton, and there is a, took them more than one year to come up with this document. They said about 14 months. But just to say, I still have to applaud them, but you know when the last ACCHA guideline of the coronary revascularization was? In 2011. So after 10 plus years, finally we have the new guidelines, and there are few important points. One, they talk about the equity of care. Irrespective of the sex or ethnicity, patients should get care. More importantly, there should be no disparity. The lot of emphasis that you need to encourage these patients to come to the center. So one of the happen in the ethnic way, many people don't go to the hospital, and we know that. Key is that you have to have a clear system, the, those kind of community outreach that patients are getting into the system and getting the, come to the table, at least. Uh, and then of course, uh, the patient at the decision making uh, for the informed consent, all pre-post care, uh, 
uh, the individual calculation which I mentioned with the hard team, STS, syntax score, and so, and more importantly, FFR, they made a class one indication. FFR should be done, and imaging is actually 2A. Uh, and they have complex situation uh, for left ventricular dysfunction, left main, multi-vessel disease, which I put it in a simple way, that if patient with a stable syndrome, you have angina, you do revascularization. But if patient does not have angina, the question comes, do, what do you do to improve patient survival? So you have to know on the angiogram if they left main disease. And data have shown that left main disease, ideally, if they're complex, should go for coronary artery bypass surgery. But some cases may not be a candidate, then you can do a PCI, the optimum trial which I showed. Then if there is a, not a significant complexity, you can do both cabbage or PCI. So very good encouraging data from there. Now, if you have multi-vessel disease, uh, they really put the LV dysfunction uh, at the prime. That if you have a bad LV, you prefer more cabbage. If your LV is good, more than 50 cabbage PCI uh, all remain class two indication. So this is, although there is a lot of controversy, a lot of surgeons actually uh, objected that how cabbage is the 2B was class one, but this is one of the committee chair was surgeon. So this is because those are the data. Data have shown that PCI do good job uh, in long term in these patients. And then of course the complexity, the diabetes, the all various individual and, and you know, recommendations. The important is the rehabilitation, smoking cessation, and psychosocial risk factors. Important to incorporate in patient uh, management, which we don't think much about. So basically, a lot of emphasis on the pre and post care. And that is the key uh, in this trial, uh, in the recommendation. So these are the top 10 advances of 21, 22. So I just put it together. I presented a lot of data I call central illustration, which is in part of most of the articles now, that what did we learn and how did we have practice change? FFR guided PCI in cabbage, fame. FFR guided PCI in MI, flower MI, and short dapt in acute coronary syndrome, thumbs down, not good. Then P PCI versus cabbage and unprotected left main with a meta-analysis, PCI in cabbage turned down cases, drug-coated balloon, hemoglobin A1C, thumbs up. Imaging-guided PCI, DAPT de-escalation, clopidogrel better than aspirin, new CIN score, double thumbs up. And then real is the short DAPT in high bleeding risk patients and all, and more importantly, 2021 revascularization guideline, triple thumbs up to make us better interventionalist and improve patient survival. Now people say, well, maybe the interventional numbers are going down. It did, of course, during COVID time, yes, but overall, this is the data for at Sinai. Uh, grow, PCI, reasonable growth from 3,700 to 3,828, but big growth here in the, our structural intervention. Of course, uh, other types of structure here, but uh, the Tower and Tavi numbers, 22% uh, growth, and of course, Jin who is in the front, uh, she'll present the data clearly, and growth continues. Structural, more growth will happen. I think still will continue some growth in the coronary intervention, but clearly structural intervention. Now, these are the latest report from the report card from the state. We still remain number one in terms of the volume, 30-day uh, risk adjusted mortality, and readmission. We got double star means good, one star is bad, 6.83 compared to nine. So our readmission rate is significantly lower, and more important, besides this annual event, we have every month three uh, live relays of the coronary, peripheral, and structural cases, and that has been a great, great success. Now, over 2 million viewers, each month we get about uh, 16 to 18,000 hits, uh, and so between CCC Live and YouTube, and of course, the new website has been a little more interactive, and uh, the, of course, uh, the app lady we call Dr. Keeney, has so many apps which are being developed to make interventions life simpler and easier. And this is really thank to all our cath lab attendings uh, to make where we are in all our safety and of course the volume, the number one in the United States. And thank you very much.